friends across the campus and beyond, Tony Pellegrini with Teaching and Learning at Southern Utah University. We're tickled this morning to have two guests with us to, to incur, engage in conversation. Uh, Brie K Kramer, uh, an associate or assistant professor? Assistant for Assistant right now. professor uh, <laughs> uh, in our education department and uh, a Provost Award winner last year for Outstanding Educator in Inclusion and, and, and Diversity. And additionally, we have Danica uh, Soberbell. How bad was that? Soberbell. Soberbell. Yeah. I apologize. No, no With worries. a name like Pellegrini, I should get all of these right, <laughs> uh, is our Associate Provost of Equity and Inclusion and our Chief Diversity Office here on campus. And um, we'd just like to uh, honor them today for their accomplishments and have a conversation about what's coming up in their person or with their professional lives. Um, Bree, would you be willing to give just a short introduction? Tell us a little about yourself, your background, your experience here at SUU. Yeah, I'm Bree Kramer, and this is my sixth year at SUU. I'm an assistant professor of Social Foundations of Education, and I teach currently in the graduate program. Um, is teaching uh, the core classes and then for the educational foundations and policy major in the graduate program as well. Um, I've taught for almost 20 years in a lot of different spaces. Um, and I just really like teaching students and I don't think I could imagine myself doing anything different. Uh, they are fun. Uh, <laughs> students are absolutely why we're here. Danica, would you be willing to take a moment or two, tell a little about yourself and about your your activities here at SUU? Sure, absolutely. I've been here at SUU for 18 months, um, and my background is in psychology and sociology, and I have been in the world of equity, diversity, diversity and inclusion for about 20 years as well, mm -hmm. um, especially coming to Utah. I started at, in student affairs as an advisor uh, and quickly found myself into multicultural student services and international um, LGBTQ veterans, and I also uh, love teaching students. I miss it. I haven't mm -hmm. taught in quite a while, but I get to teach in sociology this next upcoming semester, which I'm excited about. Um, but I have just really enjoyed finding, using my time to be able to support those who have been traditionally underserved in, in higher ed. Mm -hmm. It's been really rewarding. So. Thank you so much, yeah. and, and we're grateful for the contributions that you offer here at SUU as well. Uh, I'd like to press you just a little further. Um, talk to us a little about the Summit on Belonging. Um, I, I, uh, as I as I invited you uh, to participate, I, I was really I'm really fascinated with the creative process. Can you talk for a moment, maybe just how that process started in your mind or, or what led you to say that, hey, this is would be an exciting endeavor to make? Yeah, absolutely. So this is not my brainchild. This is actually uh, collaborative work with the Equity and Inclusion Committee uh, that we formed about six or seven months ago on campus, which Bree is a part of. Um, and we saw, sat and thought about what would be most pertinent for our campus right now of where we are. And we wanted to make sure that people had enough tools, enough knowledge, enough skills to be able to feel like they could walk into um, EDI work and feel comfortable. And so we thought, why not start with a summit that we can give people that information and give those tools. And so we, I think, kicked around the idea for quite a while. And why it's called the Summit on Belonging is because we wanted to really be able to make the relationship between diversity, which is a condition uh, of a group, um, inclusion, which are our collective behaviors, and equity, which is a lens through which we look. And when all those things work together, the outcome is belonging. And we really wanted to focus on helping people get through kind of any barriers that they may have thinking about, well, is diversity actually for me? Um, so I think that's a, a common and valid question that lots of people have. We wanted to make sure that we could focus on the outcome really being belonging and people feeling accepted and valued wherever they're coming from and whoever they are. So that's how we kind of formulated um, the summit this this year. Very exciting. Um, as our listeners, uh, whether they're faculty or students, um, engage and want to participate, what are some of their, what be, would be some of their hopes or dreams that they would be able to, to take away from uh, participating in the summit? Yeah, that's a great question. So we hope to have the summit every year, and this year we chose the theme of everyday equity. And our goal is to be able to give two or three takeaways in each session that people can easily implement into their everyday work. And so folks who participate should expect that every session that they go to, they'll be able to have two simple 
um, techniques or skills that they'll be able to, to utilize. And we have sessions that range from anything from how to create a caring and inclusive mm -hmm. classroom to the legalities of equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, to simple things like say this, not that, just language and how do you, how do you utilize language in a way that helps folks feel included, um, to how to use an equity lens. And so it really depends on what people are looking for, but we try to design so that no matter where you were sitting on campus and what your role was, there's something for you that you could participate in and hopefully take away. What wonderful uh, tools. I, I loved the metaphor of, you know, a lens and vocabulary, um, uh, understanding from our senses, how we can connect with others in a positive and a proactive way um, by, by, by putting on a set of glasses that help us see things uh, a little more broadly. Absolutely, that's a really great analogy. Thanks for for explaining what a, that lens. That was oh. a really good uh, <laughs> kind of a visualization of that. Thanks. No, you're very welcome, Bree. Um, uh, with your uh, social foundations learners, and I know you participated in the creation of this. Uh, what are some of the um, uh, suggestions or invitations that you're making to your learners to to participate and engage and and learn from these summit activities uh, to help and support them in class? Well, I definitely think um, creating a caring classroom uh, would be a great um, session for either pre-service or in-service teachers to either catch later or go live um, to because they they need more support in how to do this. Um, we all do as teachers. We all can learn something from that session, um, even if we've been teaching for a really long time. So um, I also think uh, for undergrads, the session on how to talk about issues of diversity and inclusion with families would be a great one. Um, they come to college, they learn a lot of new things, um, they're, they're kind of sorting through maybe what they've brought with them from home and it, trying to integrate these new ideas into that. And sometimes that can cause a little tension when they go back for the holidays or go back for the semester break. And so I think a session like that would perhaps give them maybe some techniques and tools on how to have conversations appropriately and not really, you know, get into, you know, divisiveness uh, in the family, but learn to, to handle these issues with um, a sense of knowledge and um, tact, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I was very uh, impressed with and uh, pleased with the perspective of that 20 years teaching experience mm -hmm. that you have. Uh, schools are a little bit different than 20 <laughs> years ago, aren't they? Students and families yeah. are a little bit different than they were 20 years ago. Um, do you see this, uh, both this uh, summit uh, and also your instruction, your coursework, as supportive and helpful and nurturing to your learners to be able to to identify what's happening in homes and schools and communities today. Absolutely. Um, all of my graduate students in the past year have really talked about the weight that's kind of been put on them um, in school districts. Um, teachers are being, you know, accused of teaching critical race theory, and we have the book banning that's going on. And, you know, they're just trying to teach their students every day and do what's best for students in the classroom. Um, and they're kind of getting sucked into some of these issues um, when you know, maybe they don't even understand what they're completely about. So um, I think that, you know, this type of summit is a great way to, um, you know, pull out more information and, and tie in some things that you already know with some things that you want to learn. Um, so I think that's, you know, another great piece that the summit offers everyone is everyone comes in with a different form of knowledge and everyone will walk out with something different as well. Exciting. It's kind of, kind of like the McDonald's. We've got <laughs> something for everyone here for you today. Um, um, uh, Danica, uh, as your uh, as a component of the equity, inclusion, and diversity work that you do, um, as you work with faculty and students across campus, mm -hmm. what are some of the skills that you're hoping that your learners, faculty and and students, uh, will take away from your association, your collaboration, your connection with with those who, with whom you come in contact? Great, that's a great question. I hope that we learn how to make mistakes with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we don't necessarily talk about is that as we figure out how to be more inclusive, as we figure out what behaviors are helpful and what are not, we are going to make mistakes with mm -hmm. each other. We have to be able to find a space where we can quickly identify those and apologize for those and then move on. Um, and so I hope that 
some of the work that I get to do with faculty helps people know, like, all of us are going to make mistakes. We should have some confidence to know that as we're trying, those will come and that we can get over those um, and work with them and learn from them. And I hope also that my work helps our faculty and our administrators as well really think strategically and, and plan ahead. I think sometimes we find ourselves in situations where we're like, oof, I know I could have done that better. I don't know exactly what I could have done better, but I hope that my office and my work can help folks think a little bit ahead of the, the curve and start planning for the needs that students have and the different kinds of perspectives that our students are bringing. Um, and so I think it just makes all the difference when we're intentionally inviting people in to say, hey, we know our students are different than they were 20 years ago. We have listened to what students need. We're responding and we're planning ahead. It's hard to, um, to do a lot of work when we feel like we're playing catch up. So those are the things that I hope that I can offer. Uh, well, and I think it's great evidence, the, the, the collaboration, the connection, that you made in putting together the summit through listening to, to many uh, to be able to say, these are some things that we do need and can can uh, move forward with. And maybe even make a mistake or two along the way, but like you say, uh, uh, ask for uh, forgiveness and move forward and learn, for, le learn from those approaches and mistakes that we've made. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the whole process of learning no matter <laughs> where we are in the process, that we're not going to get it correct the first time, but it's important for us to be intentional about about stretching. So. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me uh, uh, change the topic just a little bit. Bree, uh, I'd love to hear more. I know uh, I, I'm just so tickled and impressed with the book that you have yeah. written. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, the work and effort that went into that uh, labor of love and, and what we might, uh, learning we might acquire through reading it? Yeah, so the book that Jennifer McKenzie, who's a colleague of mine in the College of Ed, um, we co-edited the book, Children in Trauma, Critical Perspectives for Meeting the Needs of Diverse Educational Committees or Communities. Um, and it took a while to create this book during COVID. Um, we kind of came on the topic as a fluke. We had been doing a, a study um, in a couple elementary schools and um, pretty pretty southern Utah, um, like Kanab and um, Washington County area. And our study got squashed halfway <laughs> through because of COVID. Um, and so we wanted to do something with the knowledge that we gained. And we saw a call for like a textbook chapter, I think it was. And so we contacted the, the company and, and they met with us on Zoom and they said, well, you know, actually this sounds like it'd be a great book. Would you want to do a book? And we just said, sure. <laughs> so um, it just kind of took flight pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, a lot of communities and, and school districts in Utah are utilizing trauma-informed practices. And that's really the central idea of the text is how we think about um, trauma-informed practices, how we use them in diverse settings, um, and especially because the initial framework of adverse childhood experiences was that study was completed with a dominant white population. Um, and so the way that other communities are experiencing trauma is very different from that initial study. Um, and that's something that we found in our research. That's something that we saw in action um, as well. And so we really wanted to make sure that educators and practitioners were aware that there's more to this than just that initial study. So um, we have um, several, I think there's about 15 chapters in the text um, from all different authors. We look at early childhood, we look at urban and rural communities, we look at indigenous, black, Latinx communities. Um, we have a lot of variety in the text. It really would speak to any teacher, any practitioner, anybody who works with children, um, K through 12 children can learn something from that. Um, and I think especially post pandemic, it's really necessary. We've all gone through a collective trauma. Uh, teachers are really struggling in some ways to um, support students appropriately. Teachers are struggling themselves. Um, and so this, this is a text that I think comes at a really timely moment um, that we can all take something out of. Thank you so much, and I, you really make me uh, think too as, as, as we review the text and, and, and look into it. Are there, uh, with your students, Bree, and your, so your master's learners, and Danica, with the students and faculty, too, that you engage with, uh, do you see these trauma, uh, exper traumatic experiences, these um, as impacting your learners' lives? 
Absolutely. We just had a conversation last night in my master's class, in my social foundations class, um, about for teachers, I think I would better define it as a moral injury. Um, teachers have been morally injured, not just because of the pandemic, but because of a lot of policies and procedures that, you know, they have to do as teachers as part of their job, but may not really work to best serve students. Um, and so we talked quite extensively about that last night. Um, and that seems to be coupled with this trauma that teachers have, ex they've taken on vicarious trauma through their students um, and what their experiences were. Teachers themselves experienced trauma during covid um, in many different ways. Um, and so, you know, we are seeing this at every level. I mean, even administrators have a level of trauma as they've, you know, tried to make decisions, um, you know, in the midst of a global pandemic. So um, I think everyone involved in schools has some level of trauma, and we just may not be aware of um, exactly what those all are yet. Thank you so much, Danica, please. Yeah, I, I agree with... <clears throat> With Brie wholeheartedly, I think, in my perspective, especially being in a position where we're trying to support minoritized students, um, but the, there's a lot of folks who are also minoritized supporting mm -hmm. those students. And so you have this phenomenon of you individually and personally experiencing the same kind of traumas that your students are um, and being both the caregiver and also the victim mm -hmm. of, of the things that are happening in our country and across our, our world. And so it's a really difficult situation to try to figure out how do you support someone when you're also experiencing those same things. Yeah. And so we find, and, and I worry, you know, what keeps me up at night is how do we support people enough that they can stay, you know? Mm -hmm. Not just at, at our institution, but in our state, um, sometimes in our country, when there seems to be so many things that continuously happen and there's little recovery time mm -hmm. before you're dealing with the next emergency or the next you know, trauma event. And so I absolutely see it as well. Um, and I see it in that place where there's a, a pinch point where folks are trying to, to live through and support others at the same time. It's, it's, yeah. it's difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it is, and I know we've already shared this, but it's even different than a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it changes so fast and so, so furiously. One, really one last uh, topic I'd like to address, Marie, you, you fascinated, I was fascinated with the perspective that you identified, you know, with the challenges and the trauma that uh, the pandemic brought to us. I, I think it also brought uh, the opportunity to, to stay connected, to interact via technology. How do you see technology or how do you use technology in your current assignments? Uh, yes, to we want to stay face to face and encourage and, and have those connections, but we can't uh, ignore those that maybe are at a distance or, 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 or even if they're geographically close for, some, for one reason or another can't participate hand-to-hand uh, -hand with us. Do you use technologies in your day-to-day -day work and, and in your instruction and engagement with your learners? Oh, definitely. There's such a wealth of resources online, especially for the courses that I teach. Um, you, you know, they're looking at multimedia from different teachers. There's been so many different webinars and um, just, you know, conferences done online during COVID that are all surrounding issues of diversity and inclusion. Um, so utilizing those is definitely something that I've been doing, um, you know, since I've started putting classes together, but absolutely more since they started putting more online um, during the pandemic. Um, but all of my learners are online, which is really kind of interesting and also nice at the same time that we can connect and they get to tell their stories that they um, have from their different districts and their own personal background. And we all get to learn from each other in a space that um, technology provides, which is really um, kind of interesting. Same. Absolutely. For me, um, you know, the the coming up of Zoom has been <laughs> so important, I think, in our work. Same. There's a lot of um, opportunities to learn from there. The summit will be completely streamed. Mm -hmm. um, almost all the sessions will be streamed live for that reason. Uh, we, but we also have the opportunity to do focus groups, to hear from students, to have listening circles via technology, which has been really helpful. Um, and I think that we have also reached a lot of folks that we wouldn't normally have reached through technology. I was looking through some data yesterday. Um, and we have 
almost as many African American graduate students online as we do students here face to face, which was to me was was really interesting and surprising and great. You know, I think that there's a lot of other things that we've been thinking about of how to reach a wider swath of students, um, and that will all happen through technology. So I think that we have a a really important. Um, opportunity to make an impact in the communities who need the educational opportunities, and those will all be through technology. So, it's exciting. It is. We. Um, I, I'm not one of those that wants to think about the old days. Uh, I think the days we've got are exciting enough. Uh, Bree, Danica, thank you so much for being here. Before we break, would, would you just give uh, uh, some last words of advice to teachers and students that that want to be able to teach better and learn better? If they could be here today, Danica, what would you share with them? Um, I think I would say start small. The, the, those tiny, simple changes that we can make to curriculum, to pedagogy, to classroom management are the ones that are sustainable. If we can get to the point where we are sustaining those small changes, those things make great differences over time. So don't be overwhelmed with the grandiosity of the work. Start small, stay consistent, and you'll be able to find you know, some really good changes that will benefit our students. Thank you. Yeah. Bree, any ideas? I would say find your people. Um, there's a lot of people that want to do some of the same things that you have the, the courage to do in your classroom. And so find people to collaborate with, find people to share ideas. That may be colleagues, that may be people in the community, it may be parents, it may be students. Um, but really collaborating to create those relationships, I think that'll help sustain those changes that Danica shared um, are really the that's the best advice that I would give is collaborate. Thank you so much. And I keep promising one last question, one last question. I'm sorry, it's just come to me. I'm really here to honor both of you. Uh, have I missed anything that ignored anything that you would really like to share with our listeners? I, I think I just consistently want to remind campus that my office is open for them. I am a resource for campus. I think sometimes we're kind of waiting to hear, like, what do you want us to do? I want you to think of those things for your for yourselves, what works in your space, and let me help be a catalyst to what you're thinking of doing. But I, I'm, my office is open. I'm here as a resource. Please utilize me. Thanks for that invitation. Yes. I didn't want to shut you down, Bree. Please, anything you I would tell students, um, you know, there are a lot of faculty and staff who are working on these initiatives all across campus. And so um, you may be surprised at how many of us are involved and, and really working. And we like to see the student perspective as well. And students are working in their own respective capacities um, on their own committees and in conjunction with some of the work that we've been doing as well. So um, just, you know, thank you to all of those who have come together to help make the summit and, you know, continue these efforts at SUU because it we definitely need to continue to to create the change that needs to happen on campus. Friends, thank you so very much. Friends and family out there across campus, uh, thank you for listening today. We appreciate you. And uh, if you get a chance, please accept Danica's invitation, accept <laughs> Bree's invitation. You may have to sneak into her online class, come by and visit and get the password to get in. But I think she'd love to have you uh, listen and participate. Thank you one and all. And thank you so much for being here today with thank us. You. Have thank a you. great day.